So welcome to Art Laboratory Berlin and uh, our seminar on living systems and aquatic systems. Regina has a, a master's in art history from Humboldt University and has uh, is doing research on uh, art and science as well as having a lot of experience on art and space, art and text. And uh, she will give a kind of overview within the context of the Lamin Sensitivity series. Okay, thank you everyone for coming. It's fantastic to have this afternoon a safe space. Thanks for Robertina and Kat also to be here as our guest speakers and um, uh, solo artists in the current show. And I'd like to uh, round up a little bit our theoretical ideas what made us um, conceive the series non human subjectivities. And I can definitely say connecting to the sphere, the very current aspect of art and object, art and perception, that we have uh, moved our way there in the last two years already, not only actually with positions like Brandon Ballanger, who is actually artist and biologist in one person, and who actually worked in the lab, which you can see clearing and staining the red and the blue from the salamander, which is about to die out in the Netherlands, the fire salamander, and then he found an aesthetic moment actually to put it into an artistic context. Or if I just do this quickly to come more thoroughly into the non-human subjectivities in a little while, if you allow me. Or we also had in the same year, 2014, Maya Smreka from Ljubljana, one of the big art and science hubs. We could say um, she was in our series of micro microbiologies in the second exhibition of the title Organism, and she was there with an interesting work, um, bio based risky zoographies, zoographies. And it was all about invasive and local species. So basically, if you allow me to, put it, to keep it short at that point, uh, it is a very interesting biopolitical contribution as well of course, and uh, very much non-object oriented and also non-human subjectivities probably already took part in our series for the non-human subjectivities. We put it into a publication and we're very happy to show you and share with you our publication that was coming out last year, um, Macro Microbiologies, Art and the Biological Sublime in the 21st Century. And this is basically what always is our interest showing interesting, provocative art at the border of science to question, I'm sorry to put it that broad, to question the 21st century. So, that actually put us into a moment in 2014 where we saw, we saw the interesting artworks and internationally we wanted to have more of those and had an open call and invited art, artists internationally to come with us into the con contact and communication on the level of non-human subjectivities. And the theoretical approach, if you allow me to put this at the moment forefront, before I will show you the artworks that we have already shown and discussed <coughs> and we are working theoretically on them, let me just say a little bit about the theoretical framework. It's um, basically what Chris and me have come upon, before I go into the theories mentioned here, is we see it very broad. Four to five hundred years ago, Copernicus and Galileo removed the Earth and humanity from the center of the universe. And in Western philosophy, this coincides with the epistemological turn away from cosmology. Western civilization, through the Enlightenment and into the modern age, has continued to place the human experience at the center of existence. So, we are happy to actually come back in the Copernican revolution in the 21st century as we see it. And we think we are interested in recent philosophical works that strongly question anthropocentric approaches. So we have actually, we are very fond of John Gray and his publication from 2002, Straw Dogs, through uh, thoughts on humans and other animals. And interesting enough that at the time when he published that he was very much criticized, but now in the last 13 years we have very much come to the discourse of Anthropocene. So he was actually a thinker ahead of the time, basically, and uh, with his radical criticism to humanism. Um, John Gray, if you just let me to quote from his uh, thoughts, just 
two interesting positions that may help us to discuss the positions that we look later on thoroughly and we also have in the presentations of Robertina and Kat later on. So I'll just quote two parts that I find interesting. If you believe that humans are animals, there can be no such things as the history of humanity, only the lives of particular humans. If we speak of history of the species at all, it is only to signify the unknowable sum of these lives. As with other animals, some lives are happy, other wretched. None has a meaning that lies beyond itself. End of quotation. Or at another point, he turns out and says, I quote, the call of birds and the traces left by wolves to mark off their territories are no less forms of language than the song of humans. What is distinctively human is not the capacity for language, it is the crystallization of language in writing. End of quote. Then you can see that we are very uh, interested in Rosie Bright Dotti, the post human, uh, read, um, published in 2013. It's a very, very interesting source um, to come closer to what might, one might call post-humanism or also post-anthropocentrism. And I want to quote Rosie Bright Dotti, who is similar in her thought and anthropocentric criticism. I quote, instead of falling back on the sedimented habits of thought that the humanist past has institutionalized, the post-human predicament encourages us to undertake a leap forward into the complexities and paradoxes of our time. And so she is very um, much to develop a critical thought with the awareness of the person as becoming. And um, she questions like how to install a community based purely on ethics without all that suspicion. Um, she is um, questioning capitalism, biogenetics, um, biotechnologies as well. And um, let me just quote another thought that we might come back to later on while discussing artistic positions. Most specifically, post-human theory is a generation generative tool to help us rethink the, the, the basic unit, unit of a reference for the human in the biogenetic age known as Anthropocene. The historical moment when the human has become a geological force capable of affecting this planet. So, and you can see that uh, you are very much uh, interested as well, of course, in the many fold writings and publications by Donald Haraway, um, Companion Species Manifesto, or What a Species Mean is only one of the most interesting writings by the very um, interesting thinker Donald Haraway. And my, what I also think, and this is what interests us, and I come here with a quotation that I'm going to share with you visually, is the Speculative realism as a form of current philosophical approach is also interesting for us as it questions the human approach. And I just want to quote it in here that it is, what you see here, objecthood becomes the center of the discourse and with it a reality. And here I quote Armin Avalesian. A reality which is indifferent to subjective human cognition and cannot be conveyed through a subjectivist or anthropocentric conditional knowledge and therefore cannot be primarily codified. And here comes what I think is the criticism of post-structuralism. I go on this quotation. Cannot be primarily codified culturally, linguistically, politically, or historically. So far, enough of a few. Theoretical approaches, let me come to the artists um, that we find interesting and we have chosen for exhibition and we want to question and uh, work theoretically on in the future and I also want to prepare a bit of theoretical work and I'd like to show you a first, I call it chapter or exhibition or part that we started with the non-human subjectivity series piece and it was four artistic positions and the chapter exhibition we call The Other Selves on the Phenomenon of the Microbiome. And here you might say, well, this has very much to do with the human body, yes, but it very much wants to refer to the fact that the human body is at least half of the cells in our human body is not human. So basically what we want to 
come close with um, what Donna Haraway says in 2008 with Species Meat is what she said, to be one is always to become with many. So actually it is uh, the human body is what we have to consider as an ecosystem. What you see here is a very interesting work by someone who is as well an artist and a scientist at the same time. Francois-Joseph Lapointe from Montréal. He is a microbiologist and he is a performance artist. And this is only a part of the work, um, dancing with myself, microbiome selfie. So basically network analysis, what we have in bioinformatics, is only the visual result of a whole process that he does as a microbiologist, but then he wants to visualize moments that he do not find, that he does not only find aesthetic, but that he would also find noteworthy in a sort of an artistic, cultural, aesthetical sense, and maybe even social political sense actually to, to share the data in an art science context. We did not only show that piece here, which you can see a connection between his mouse and gut microbiome that you see, it's, it's a sort of an abbreviation what we see here in network analysis, visualization. But I also would like to sh share with you an interesting project, and I think most of you have been probably at the opening of the Transmediale on the 3rd of February in 2016 in House of the Culture of the World, or House de Culture der Welt. And here you have the performance that um, Lapointe realized for the fifth time. And I mention this because here comes art and science directly together. So on the one hand, it's a performance that has been repeated in Copenhagen, in other cities he did this, and here in Berlin he did this for the first time, but the performance was realized for the fifth time. That means he can now also publish a scientific paper. So the project, as the title says, 100 Handshakes, is um, what it says, he goes the whole night after more or less cleaning his hand 99.9% off from bacteria, he has actually shaped, he was shaking thousands and one hands. And after about each 15th handshake, he took a probe, a sample. And you can see here Alana, our colleague, and others uh, from our team and um, from his own team and from the Transmediale team, so he, and he was not alone. So there were samples taken. But what the photo, I think, also shows quite well is that he took not only samples, but he took time to speak to the person with whom he was shaking hands. And I was considering, you were considering that part very important. Because that is a moment where microbiome is transmitted. I mean, that's what we do every day. But then as well, also, he started a conversation about the microbiome. So he had a counter in his left hand and he started something like, oh, hello, you're my number 73. And by this um, unplausible start of a conversation, he was already in the midst of um, talking about <laughs> transmission and also a cultural um, aesthetic notion towards that. Um, so the results that he did was three weeks later in our show. And um, as well as he says, it is um, network analysis. He used, um, he took the probes and put, used um, the lab in his uh, faculty in Montreal um, and uh, analyzed the probes. But he did not actually want to show one to one here in an exhibition space the results. But he rather wanted to share um, some phenomenological moments of network communication among bacteria as a model, as a, a device, as a, um, a platform of communication. And I find this interesting at this moment, and I'd like to actually refer this to an idea of Karin Babat and her interesting uh, publication. Um, where, let me see, the publication is called Meeting the Universe Halfway, Quantum Physics and the Entanglement of Matter and Meaning, which you published in 2007. And I think at this moment, 
I just can't help but I want to quote her as saying, a performative understanding of scientific practices, for example, takes account of the fact that knowing does not come from standing at a distance and representing, but rather from a direct material engagement with the world. She later on also um, states and stresses the fact that this statement does not only, or actually not so much has to do with performance art in a direct sense, rather like a performative act. But I see here a really direct um, relation because uh, Laplante is in one person scientist and artist. And with his performative artistic practice, he said once, he has found an interesting tool to actually come, what Barat says, a material engagement with the world in his own scientific uh, research. So the performance actually was very much an act in manifold ways. For instance, there's also the moment of handshake, which is from the cultural historical point of view, a one oldest gesture that we have to come into contact with someone, to come into communication with someone, to actually have the physical contact with someone, like to exchange, in other words, also the microbiome of one with someone else. Um, yeah. So I said art and science in one person. The visibility as a phenomenon in both domains, that is also interesting. So in the end, you would have in the lab a network analysis. He said what he took out here for an artist's context was the numbers and letters. So he, as a microbiologist, could not read these visuals anymore. But in the lab, with the letters and numbers, very much he could analyze them. Again, we could also come to consider his piece, the performance piece, as what we might call from Donna Haraway, the companionship. You know? Shaking hands, transferring material to make them visible. So to make not only the scientific experiment visible, just actually to make communication visible. Um, yeah, let me let me go on. Um, also, if you allow me to have maybe a close to look at this, another interesting artist um, from this first chapter exhibition, the microbiome, is an Australian artist, Tash Bates. She's about to finish her PhD at Symbiotica in the Western um, Australian University. And she has a background also of biotechnology and arts in one person. She explores what it means to be human when we recognize our bodies as composed of our one trillion cells, of which only around half are human. And what her artistic practice is involved with is uh, yeast, is candida mostly candida albicans. So she works with a substance matter that is always with our body, sometimes more, sometimes less, and when we come, become aware of it, and she found out in her artistic research more women would talk about it and become aware of it, then we would rather consider it um, and become aware of it as a negative appearance in our human, in our human body. She created a piece that you see here above, and she created this for the exhibition this year, and it has the interesting title, Surface Dynamics of Adhesion. And we see maybe first, which makes sense, we see the traditional 19th century furniture. And we think of a Victorian time living room. And then we see something in behind, which looks like a frieze, like a relief, and here we have it closer. It looks like a flocked wallpaper. But then, if you come closer and if you understand what it is, you become aware that it's a sealed acrylic boxes in agar based on the blood of the artist. It's a living candida. But for the version here in Germany, for security, and uh, what we can do in Germany and what we cannot do in Germany, but we she could present the candida albicans, she could have living candida albicans 
in Australia in shows, but in Germany he said we take the level one. So she used another candida, candida parapsinosis. And here she had it like, grow in certain patterns. And now actually comes the moment that I find highly interesting, and I would like to consider this more thoroughly in the future, more theoretical. Because if you look closer, you have the pattern expressed by a candida. But the pattern in itself that she evoked here in the rectangular agar plate is actually the same as the first drawing from the middle of the 19th century by Charles Philippe Robin, a microbiologist, who was drawing for the first time in the Albicans. So what do we have here? We have what I find fascinating overlapping of science and visualizations. On the one hand, she refers to the medical historical form for the first visualization of the Canada Albicans, but at the same time now, she puts it into a context of flocked wallpaper in the Victorian era, which is, and she actually stresses this as well, an era where hygiene consciousness was aware and it was raised a lot. And um, my, what I could call about hysteria maybe of hygiene was erased at that time. So, um, the art installation actually puts together um, the aesthetical gender art uh, aspects and medical historical aspects. But what is Candida albicans? And I'd like to quote Tosh Bates directly. Candida albicans is an organism symbiotic with humans. It is a single-celled commensal fungus that is one of many species of microorganisms that make up the intestinal intestine, urogenital flora of humans. Without it, we would have difficulty digesting as it breaks down the sugars in the bloodstream. And at another point, like as a sort of a transformation, as a sort of an artistic theoretical interpretation of what she does here, she was um, remarking a very interesting idea, and I'd like to quote her here. As a feminist researcher, she says, Candida is of particular interest to me. Candida is culturally gendered without itself having a gender or even a sex. It is an opportunistic pathogen of vaginal tracts in particular. Many women have intimate, embodied, and emotional relationships with this microscopic creature, which usually involves trying to kill it. Candida signifies the leaky bodies of women, the unruly, the abject, the undisciplined. Through Candida, I explore what Tash Bates says. She explores the complexities of our relationship with microorganisms as an important part of our bodies, of what it means to be human. So I think another interesting layers come here together in uh, the thought and work of that piece. Also, in connection to the exhibition, she realized another artwork. It's called The Unsettling Errors of Contact Zones, where she would use candida albicans, actually lab produced candida albicans, to make bread and to offer this in the show. And then we had actually baked this at home. We did this together before baking the bread with candida. And actually, we had then, in March, it was, we had the hack day here in Oslo, Turin. Mm -hmm. And it was where the bread with cheese, which is another discussion of yeast and um, living systems, and they were offered, and actually, the most of the people were eating it, and uh, really like incorporating the work, basically. And this is another interesting part, which I just leave apart from here, just to show you maybe less thorough, another few interesting positions here. We have um, Joana Ricoul. Uh, this is um, an artist from Portugal living in New York currently. She's also blurring the fundamental boundary between organism and environment. She takes the shape of photographs of microbial paintings or performance. She collects samples of her own microbiome and that of her environment and cultured these in the lab to visualize them. What we see here, however, is the, the artwork, The Other Selves, which is a series of microbiome portraits that Riku has carried out over the last 
few years in which she has cultured samples from the belly buttons of over 400 people, resulting in an amazingly diverse range of bacteria, fungi, and archaea. Another very interesting position is definitely, again from the Ljubljana Interesting Art and Science Hub, I would say, is the artist Sasha Spachal, which you, who you see here in the photo to the left. And she works always in cooperation. So she actually already starts to work artistically, not unison, but as a, as a group. And she works with Miriam Schwagel and Anne Kodvornik, so it's a cooperative, you could say, of art, design, and biotechnology. And the work that you see here, or see here more closely, is called Michael from Unison. And it is um, a very intelligent work of connection and unifying sound and bacteria of the three, I call them now artists, which is actually functioning like the visitor could press this point with a fingerprint that makes the whole plate start to run around, which actually is that an electrical system is uh, closed as soon as someone presses a, a finger on the print. And what you see here, it goes through all the uh, petri dishes where um, bacteria was taken from all the three artists. So, and the sonification that I cannot show here, but it actually it's evoking, and it was actually changing through all, all the eight weeks of exhibition time, it actually goes uh, parallel to the bacteria of each of the three um, composers, if I can call them like that. Just um, um, as a second part, and the third part I will hand over to Robertina in a little while, let me just um, mention two other interesting positions that um, that might one might discuss under the headline of um, on animals cognition senses play. We have two very interesting female artists, Rachel Mayer from Los Angeles and Maya Smareka from Ljubljana. Again, from Ljubljana. Um, we have here. Um, Rachel Mayer's work, with which in 2007 she started a big series of work called Apes as Family. And uh, part, of, part, uh, part of you uh, visitors today, you were probably at the artist talk uh, a few weeks ago, where Rachel Mayer was uh, explaining the works. She was here as most of the artists that we were showing here, and it was a pleasure to listen to her. And what you see here is um, baboons as friends from 2007. Well, it is on the left side is an archival film footage from the 90s, uh, shot by the primatologist Deborah Foster. If you just allow me, I hope I just show you still not the whole artwork that would just crash the framework and my presentation, which I want to keep short and I hope in about seven, eight minutes I will be done. So what you see here is a two-channel film installation, sometimes shown in one monitor for the exhibition, Rachel Mayer decided to have two monitors. Which is interesting when we discuss the human and the non-human, and here definitely she comes from the primate perspective, and then actually goes over to show what you see on the right side is a sort of a reenactment. Um, a reenactment a uh, human reenactment with professional actors that go at the same time as the baboons would move and show um, moments of um, jealousy, of lust, of dominance. Uh, at the same time, the three men with the lady at the bar, they would actually, very similar, also show what it means to actually dominate the lady in a very classical way or uh, favor her, or court her, etc. So that was actually a very ironical and playful approach. Here you have this unbelievably remarkable 
film work called Apes as Family from 2012. Uh, it's actually what you see here is one video projection. Allow me that I do not show you the video, I just wanted to refer to. We watch a drama based on a tale of both chimpanzee social customs and dom domestication. While as humans we find the plot emotionally compelling, we also become caught up with watching the reactions of a chimpanzee audience watching the same film on a large TV, like here in the Edinburgh Zoo. And that makes it actually more interesting when we talk about companionship, when we talk about animal studies, when we talk about the non-object, the non-human um, subjectivity as a perspective. Um, Luckily, she had big funding behind her that made it possible to produce the, the film, to show it actually to the chimpanzees, and to record the way how they were looking. So in a way, one might call and to talk about double subjectivity, maybe we can discuss this later. And finally, also in that chapter, which we call An Animal's Cognition Senses Play, we have here again Maya Smrega, who is a very interesting work. It was a performance work that she realized and called it, ironically referring to the boys' performance work, uh, her, her work she called I Have Nature and Name in Culture Hunts Me. And she developed this during a research residency at the Jakarta Wildlife Studies in Middle France a couple of years ago and she spent here for the performance um, nearly naked some hours together with wolf dogs and a tamed wolf. And um, again, a, a, a voiceover was a reading text by Joseph Boyce, Oli Kulik, and Susan Rinas, and Smackers herself, and bringing very much the, kind of referring to the discourse of the human dog relationship. But actually, it is rather, and here I would like to show you also the work that we documented and shown, have shown canine topology at Kani's. Uh, it's very much that she artistically questions the wolf, the, the wolf dog human continuum, basically, where the dog is in the middle, a sort of tame wolf, and uh, throughout the last uh, 30,000 years, actually, a sort of a, a companion, a human companion. And here, what she did here is um, part of her big project, Canine Topology, is um, uh, Ekikani's, the first work of the series, where she explores the metabolic pathway processes that trigger emotional motives and bind humans and dogs, enabling them successfully coexist together. The installation, some parts of which were exhibited here in Berlin, contains several tonin from both the artist Smreka and her Scottish border collie Byron. Very personal work as well, and she also we have to say that she lives and coexists together with the dog. This has been transformed by chemical protocols into an order, the chemical essence of their human canine relationship. We had the tubes that is actually part of the installation. We had two tubes uh, here in Berlin exhibited. There were actually where you actually would. Um, it's for protein columns, but that was used to actually filter the serotonin, the human and the dog serotonin. And in the end, this would actually be the installation, just to explain you. It was a big horn of many meters long, and once you would want it to crawl inside the horn, at the end, you would actually see a little vessel and could smell the synthesis of the serotonin of both human and dog. Well, now we have come, and this is actually what Bettina can say this much better than I can, but I just wanted to actually bring it to the theme and just to show you actually the continuum of our thoughts and then of our um, series as exhibition, but also theoretical work that we have ahead is the place for Bettina in the context of the non-human subjectivities and have come all together to the title of the oral aquatic presence. And you probably saw the exhibition we have um, two big works, one which we have shown here, show here, shown here as a um, video installation, already one plus has called to be the sonification, the performance from Paris from 2015, and we have already one plus has called to be the generator, 
the artwork from 2014 as an installation in Capenza in Ljubljana. If you allow me to say that we actually have still ahead more artists, and both in exhibition practice and also theoretically to think about it, just a moment, two minutes, we, have, we are working together with a very interesting, interesting artist, Vivi Xun, from China, based in China and the US, and we are in contact with Brian Neck, um, an interesting artist from Boston, Huai Shen, an art intermediator of ants, as he says, and many, many others. We work together with so many other artists also here in Berlin, uh, connected to uh, non human subjectivities such as allergy or phages, etc. So we have a lot ahead, but let me make, if you allow me to finish my presentation, with the phenomenon of visualization processes, because here finally we come very much together when it's an artistic visualization or a scientific visualization. So maybe actually discussing the non-human, um, again, because I have to zoom not more, you have here different forms of visualization. You have left above the bacteria visualization in the petri dish. You have right above, you have the yeast visualization, both artistically, flock as a wallpaper, but also actually like coming, referring to the drawing of the middle of the 19th century as the drawing of the micro um, um, substance of Candida albicans. And left below, you find the artistic scientific visualization of La Pointe with a gut and mouth microbiome. And to the right, and here I end and refer to Robertina, you have underwater sound waves. So basically, an interesting artistic scientific visualization that Robertina came upon with her newest work, Aquatic Soundscapes. And with this, I come to an end and thank you so much for your attention.
Um, but I, I think uh, it's gone from being you know, a call that there's a crisis to one, oh, uh, humans can uh, produce the solution. And actually, I disagree with that. I, I think uh, the, pro the problems that exist uh, happen because uh, of uh, humans seek simple, efficient answers to complex problems. And I think only you know, they, these problems have they have solutions. They're complex solutions. So I think we're probably from language out uh, incapable of dealing even, and certainly not capable of, of solving our own problems that we create. Uh, in this side, I really take what some people call the pessimism of, uh, of John Gray uh, into life. But I think yeah, I don't see the pessimism. I think it's a kind of realism. But the one thing he points out is a lot of this comes from from Western civilization, from the Judeo-Christian tradition, where, you know, but also uh, hyped in the 17th century enlightenment through Descartes, the idea of animals as machines, and only humans have this kind of uh, sentience uh, or special consciousness. And, uh, and he, you know, uh, I guess in the end he says, this attitude will not solve the problems, it will even exacerbate them. Crisis, uh, uh, but uh, you know, you said the only thing he was very pessimistic about his possibilities is even in the developing world, these ideas from Western civilization and Buddhism become dominant. But he was, you know, his idea was to say, well, you can test your Taoist you can take many different points where humans are just part of, uh, you know, one animal among any, part of a, of, a, of a flux of movement, not anything special. We, that's why we make this reference to Copernicus uh, in our, uh, our website, in our original text, and in the open call, was this idea that suddenly the world changed uh, you know, in, between Copernicus and Galileo. Galileo was really made it known to the European world, but instead of the Earth being the center of the universe, the Earth was cast out from the center to one planet among many. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, but that is interesting in philosophy, in that following generations after Galileo almost abandons cosmology and it, you know, and, it, uh, and takes up epistemology and starts to create, you know, it's not, not I think it's a, uh, I think very much Descartes is trying to defend the human against the reality you know, of, of Copernicus and Galileo. And, you know, I think that's part of the problem. The solutions probably to, our, uh, to the problems of global warming or uh, of mass pollution have complex answers. Uh, but I think the first ones don't see ourselves as the center of everything. And maybe the second one is also the deal with complexity, uh, which is something that engineers are taught to make the most efficient solution. Uh, you know, this is uh, uh, Oakland's razor, but it's Oakland's disaster as well. Uh, I think then uh, we overlook the side effects. Some will answer? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> More questions? Well, I could just add one thing about the uh, anthropocentrism uh, question comparing to Galileo, etc. Uh, Milton Flusser, who we probably know, uh, advocated that we needed a Ptolemaic counter revolution. But the, he went back in the center in a particular sense that uh, the kind of knowledge that we get through science, scientific um, instrumentation, uh, our contemporary sciences, is uh, um, deals with scales, uh, orders of magnitude, which are um, which are not which human epistemology is not capable of encountering. And, we, and he was advocating that we cultivate the kind of forms, forms of new humanisms for the various orders of magnitude. So, as they call it, humanism and orders of magnitude. And he, he describes that. So, it's an odd proposal, but anyway, Flusser is always trying to save philosophy in the age of, of uh, technical um, images and, and uh, somehow words being. Uh, inadequate anymore to deal with the contemporary conditions of the planet's system. It's interesting because he's exactly, you know, the figure exists just, you know, before this 
crisis floor becomes known. I mean, the symptoms are there, but no one really, it's really only around the 1990s, 2000 that, you know, you kind of recognize, uh, uh, you know, it's interesting with, with John Gray, who we published in 2000, in 2002, and everyone said, oh, it's such a pessimistic worldview because the trendy thing in the 90s was technology and we'll save the world, we'll solve all our problems, so there'll be no hunger, there'll be no Okay. And suddenly he said, uh, in, you know, he was uh, saying, well, you know, maybe in, um, in 150 years there will be, a, you know, the next 100 years will be a crash in human population because, like other animals that overpopulate, there's a crash. And, uh, you know, I think that would think that, you know, most, one of the most obvious things that people forget about is the amount of soil degradation that's happening, you know, we degrade more and more soil to produce more and more food, but at some point it's going to run out, and uh, a third of the soil out there is degraded and it's not sustainable. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, the planet will survive in, in you know, this hiccup, this you know, cancerous event, but uh, I'm really skeptical about the you know, Homo sapiens. Um, Rosa Pradali brings some really interesting criticism of humanities and uh, and it was most humanities which is in critique of humanism um, in the 20th century because there's this you know, kind of after the Second World War saying we need humanism against this evil and she says well you know, even fascism itself is an offshoot of humanism and uh, you know, looking at that as a super work form we seem to be a part of it uh, uh, you know, it was also very, very obvious in hearing these quotes from the stories about it learning who lives personal lives from their people who live in you know, this ballet or something. Uh, you know, it was fascinating, you know, it was induced with the same humanism that would be on the left or the center, and it was come back in the 50s to sort of heal the world, but it was like, you know, producing a lot of things plastic, which is, I don't know. Um, 